Last week, I visited the Middle East, bringing a message of solidarity with the region against terror and against the further spread of conflict. I met with the leaders of Israel, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Egypt, and the Palestinian Authority to coordinate our response to the crisis before us, but also to renew the better vision of the future that Hamas is trying to destroy. I travelled first to Israel. It is a nation in mourning. But, Mr. Speaker, it is also a nation under attack. The violence against Israel did not end on the 7th of October. Hundreds of rockets are launched at their towns and cities every day. And Hamas still holds around 200 hostages, including British citizens. In Jerusalem, I met some of the relatives who are suffering unbearable torment. Their pain will stay with me for the rest of my days. I'm doing everything in my power and working with all our partners to get their loved ones home. So in my meetings with Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Herzog, I told them once again that we stand resolutely with Israel in defending itself against terror. And I stressed again the need to act in line with international humanitarian law and take every possible step to avoid harming civilians. It was a message delivered by a close friend and ally. I say it again, we stand with Israel. Mr Speaker, I recognise that the Palestinian people are suffering terribly. Over 4,000 Palestinians have been killed in this conflict. They are also the victims of Hamas, who embed themselves in the civilian population. Too many lives have already been lost, and the humanitarian crisis is growing. I went to the region to address these issues directly. In Riyadh, then Cairo, I met individually with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman from Saudi Arabia, the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, President Sisi in Egypt, and President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority. These were further to my meetings with the King of Jordan last week and calls with other leaders, and my Right Honourable Friend, the Foreign Secretary's extensive travel in the region. Mr Speaker, there are three abiding messages from all of these conversations. The first is that we must continue working together to get more humanitarian support into Gaza. The whole House will welcome the limited opening of the Rafa crossing. It is important progress and testament to the power of diplomacy, but it is not enough. We need a constant stream of aid pouring in bringing the water, food, medicine and fuel that is so desperately needed. So we will keep up the diplomatic pressure. We have already committed £10 million of extra support to help civilians in Gaza. And Mr Speaker, I can announce today that we are going further. We are providing an additional £20 million of humanitarian aid to civilians in Gaza, more than doubling our previous support to the Palestinian people. There are major logistical and political challenges to delivering this aid, which I discussed with President Sisi. My right honourable friend, the Development Minister, is leading an effort to ensure the maximum amount of aid is pre-positioned with UK support ready to deliver. We are also working intensively to ensure that British nationals trapped in Gaza are able to leave through the Rafa crossing when it properly reopens. The second message, Mr Speaker, is that this is not a time for hyperbole and simplistic solutions. It is a time for quiet and dogged diplomacy that recognises the hard realities on the ground and delivers help now. And we have an important role to play. In all of my meetings, people were clear that they value Britain's engagement. The UK's voice matters. We have deep ties across the region ties of defence, trade and investment, but also of history. President Abbas pointed to that history, not the British mandate in Palestine or the Balfour Declaration, but the UK's efforts over decades to support the two-state solution. And that brings me to my third point, Mr Speaker. Growing attacks by Hezbollah on Israel's northern border, rising tensions on the West Bank, and missiles and drones launched from Yemen show that some are seeking escalation. So we need to invest more deeply in regional stability and in the two-state solution. 
Last night, I spoke to the leaders of the United States, Germany, France, Italy and Canada. We are all determined to prevent escalation. That's why I'm deploying RAF and Royal Navy assets, monitoring threats to regional security and supporting humanitarian efforts. Mr Speaker, our support for a two-state solution is highly valued across the region. But it can't just be a clichéd talking point to roll out at times like this. The truth is that in recent years, energy has moved into other avenues like the Abraham Accords and normalisation talks with Saudi Arabia. We support those steps, absolutely, and believe that they can bolster wider efforts. But we must never lose sight of how essential the two-state solution is. So we'll work together with our international partners to bring renewed energy and creativity to this effort. It will rely on establishing more effective governance for Palestinian territories in Gaza and the West Bank. It will also mean challenging actions that undercut legitimate aspirations for Palestinian statehood. Mr Speaker, Hamas care more about their paymasters in Iran than the children they hide behind. So let me be clear. There is no scenario where Hamas can be allowed to control Gaza or any part of the Palestinian territory. Hamas is not only a threat to Israel, but to many others across the region. All the leaders I met agree that this is a watershed moment. It's time to set the region on a better path. Mr Speaker, I also want to say a word about the tone of the debate. When things are so delicate, we all have a responsibility to take additional care in the language we use and to operate on the basis of facts alone. The reaction to the horrific explosion at the Al-Ahli Arab Hospital was a case in point. As I indicated last week, we have taken care to look at all the evidence currently available. Mr Speaker, I can now share our assessment with the House. On the basis of the deep knowledge and analysis of our intelligence and weapons experts, the British Government judges that the explosion was likely caused by a missile or part of one that was launched from within Gaza towards Israel. The misreporting of this incident had a negative effect in the region, including on a vital US diplomatic effort and on tensions here at home. We need to learn the lessons and ensure that in future there is no rush to judgment. Mr Speaker, we have seen hate on our streets again this weekend. We all stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people. That is the message I brought to President Abbas. But we will never tolerate anti-Semitism in our country. Calls for jihad on our streets are not only a threat to the Jewish community, but to our democratic values. And we expect the police to take all necessary action to tackle extremism head on. Mr Speaker, this is a moment for great care and caution, but also for moral clarity. Hope and humanity must win out against the scourge of terrorism and aggression. The 7th of October attack was driven by hatred, but it was also driven by Hamas's fear that a new equilibrium might be emerging in the Middle East, one that would leave old divisions behind and offer hope of a better, more secure, more prosperous way forward. It is the same motivation that drives Putin's war on Ukraine, the fear of Ukraine's emergence as a modern, thriving democracy and the desire to pull it back into some imperialist fantasy of the past. Putin will fail and so will Hamas. We must keep alive that vision of a better future against those who seek to destroy it. Together with our partners, that is what we will do. And I commend this statement to the House. Mr Starber, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for an advanced copy of his statement. The brutal attack in Israel just over two weeks ago was the darkest day in Jewish history since the Holocaust. Two weeks of grief for the innocent people who lost brothers, sisters, children. Two weeks of torture for the families whose loved ones were taken hostage by Hamas. There was a small glimmer of light this weekend 
the release of two American hostages, Natalie and Judith Rahnan. I met members of their family last week, and I know that they will be overcome with relief. But Hamas still hold hundreds more, sons, daughters, mums, dads, still missing, innocent people who could, if Hamas willed it, be released immediately. But they remain hostage because Hamas want the chaos of war. Hamas want Jews to suffer. Hamas want the Palestinian people to share in the pain because the Palestinian people are not their cause. Peace is not their aim. The dignity of human life, Jew or Muslim, means absolutely nothing to them. And in the light of their barbarism, Israel has the right to defend herself. Yes, to get their hostages home, but also to defeat Hamas, so nobody needs suffer like this again. And that we might once more see a road to a lasting peace, a Palestinian state alongside a safe and secure Israel. And Mr Speaker, this operation can and must be done within international law. We democracies know that all human life is equal. Innocent lives must be protected. These are the principles that differentiate us from the terrorists who target Israel. So there must now be clear humanitarian corridors within Gaza for those escaping violence. Civilians must not be targeted. And where Palestinians are forced to flee, they must not be permanently displaced from their homes. International law is clear. It also means basic services, including water, electricity and fuel needed for it, cannot be denied. Hamas may not care for the safety and security of the Palestinian people, but we do. We cannot and will not close our eyes to their suffering. Gaza is now a humanitarian emergency. There is not enough food. Clean water is running out. Hospitals are going without medicine and electricity. People starving, reduced to drinking contaminated filth, babies lying in incubators that could switch off at any moment. The deal struck by the United States to get a flow of trucks through the Rafa crossing is an important first step. 20 on Saturday, 14 on Sunday. But it's nowhere near enough. Gaza is not a small town facing a few shortages. It has a population the size of Greater Manchester, a place even before this devastation where life was a struggle. Gaza needs aid, and it needs to be rapid, safe, unhindered and regular. Countries able to provide support must step up, including the United Kingdom, and so I welcome the increased funding for humanitarian aid that the Prime Minister has announced this afternoon. The EU has promised to treble humanitarian aid, and the US has appointed a special coordinator for international aid to Gaza. So I ask if the Prime Minister can commit to the same, because Britain must stand ready to ensure aid gets to the right places, to deploy British experts and medical support teams, and to work with international partners to give UN agencies the resources they need for the long term. Because, Mr Speaker, there is a long term. Even as we stand by Israel in her fight against Hamas, our eyes must also look to the future, a future where Israeli citizens live free from the fear of terrorist attacks, and a future for the Palestinian people, where they and their children enjoy the freedoms and opportunities that we take for granted. For too long we've talked about a two-state solution, the dignity and justice of a Palestinian state alongside a safe and secure Israel, without a serious path or will to make it happen. And for too long we have allowed welcome progress in improving relations between Israel and her neighbours to sit without any progress on the future for Palestine and its people. That must change. We stand with Israel 
and her right to defend herself against the terrorists of Hamas. We stand for international law, the protection of innocent lives, humanitarian support for the Palestinians. And we do so because we stand for a political path to a two-state solution and a better future. These are dark days, but the light must never go out. We must not let it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Leader of the Opposition for uh, his constructive comments and his support. Uh, on, just to recap, on humanitarian aid, by announcing an additional £20 million today, we will be doubling our aid to the region, which is already one of the most leading contributions of any country in the world. Uh, my, my development minister will remind me, but I think around 10% of the UN mission in the region is funded by UK contributions. Most of our aid is funneled through them. Uh, it's also worth bearing in mind that President Sisi specifically commended the efforts of the UK alongside the US in ensuring that the RAFA crossing could be open and functioning, a uh, testament to the work of our team and the Development Minister and Foreign Secretary on the ground. Uh, I can also say, in response to the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition's question uh, with regard to the UN, that the Development Minister is in close contact on an almost daily basis with Martin Griffiths, the head of the UN's humanitarian relief efforts, to ensure that the UK can play a leading role in supporting what has happened on the ground. There are considerable logistical challenges uh, in getting the aid to the people who need it, and those are areas where we can make a difference, particularly around El Arish, the logistical hub where supplies are moving to. Uh, and I can confirm that the Development Minister will tomorrow lay a written ministerial statement setting out further details of the increase in humanitarian aid that we've announced today. Uh, but in closing, uh, Mr. Speaker, I concur with what the Leader of the Opposition said in my remarks earlier, there is absolutely a future available to us which is a future more prosperous, more stable for people living in this region, where people can live with dignity, with security and with opportunity. That is the future that Hamas is trying to destroy and we should stand united to stop that from happening. Sir Julian Lewis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, okay.